<laughs> Welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm Sarah Curley, and I am so honored to bring this episode to you today. We have our producer, Chris Gimbari. Hey, Chris, so happy to have you with me today. We're here in South Lake in the studio, and we have a very special episode. This is with a child life specialist. She's local to Keller, which is my hometown, and we're recording on the South Lake studio. So this was just a little hop, skip, and a jump for Miss Lindsay Hammond. Just Welcome a in. <laughs> Not bad at all. So this is very important because in addition to focusing on grief, we're going to talk about the unique role that child life specialists have in providing the education and support to children and teens of parents who have serious illness. And your work is unique to the child life specialist industry because it's very specific to what you have brought outside of the hospital. Now, I want to start with the mindset of a child going through grief. You've brought with us several books and we're going to read a passage and then we're going to get into your story and why you do what you do and all the amazing resources. I have chills. You are such a gift Thank to you. your clients, to everybody that you're working with, to the parents, everybody. So thank you so much for coming in, Lindsay. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's start. Um, you know, this is a very emotional passage and I appreciate you bringing it in because I really wanted to set the tone with the for our audience to understand uh, a child that is going through a tremendous amount of, of grief. So the passage I want to read first um, is from a book called The Hope Tree. Um, it's called The Hope Tree, Kids Talk About Breast Cancer. And so it was written um, by children, but kind of tailored a little bit by um, an author who's a physician who's also a breast cancer survivor. Um, and so I just want to introduce you first to um, Miguel, or Anthony, who's eight years old. And Anthony shares about the day that his family found out that his mom had cancer. This is what he writes. This is a picture from the day my family found out that my mom had breast cancer. Everything was so messed up. There were a gazillion phone calls. My mom and dad were whispering, and I even heard my mom crying. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I knew it wasn't good, and I was scared. Nothing got done that day. My mom didn't do the weekly grocery shopping, so I ate cookies for dinner. My iguana, Sydney, got loose. My dad put milk in the pantry, and my sister went to sleep in her tutu. My house was never crazy like that before. I love the way that Anthony kind of summarizes what that day one sort of feels like for the, a child in a home where they get some sort of news that definitely is going to change his life. It's going to change the life of everybody in his family and probably those just on the outside of their family as well, extended family and friends, coworkers. Um, and I think Anthony does such a good job of simply describing the chaos of a serious diagnosis that parents deal with. And Lindsay, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you play such a unique role in the picture of something like this happening, whether it's an illness, grief, you know, so much. Share with me what a child life specialist is in your unique role. So I, I think I have to give just a little bit of an explanation about what a child life specialist is sort of traditionally, because yes. most people have never heard of a child life specialist. Yes. That's not I'll a bad thing. <laughs> Um, because primarily child life specialists work inside of children's hospitals. Yes. As I was Googling and doing my research, all of the YouTube videos were in the hospital. Yes. Yes. Hospital visits. Yes. So the um, historically, the role of a child life specialist is to provide essentially three overlapping things for children um, inside of the children's hospital. It is to provide them with education. Um, that means to teach them about their own diagnosis, to prepare them for procedures or treatments that they might be experiencing, help them anticipate what to expect as they go through treatment, what changes they might notice in their body or in their family or in how they feel about things. Um, we use primarily play and therapeutic play, therapeutic activity to teach kids that, to help them process all these big feelings that come along with um, having something different. Kids really don't want to be different than their peers. Um, and, and an illness or a life-altering injury really does set them apart. And so child life specialists work with kids to, um, to really help them cope with what they're experiencing for themselves going through an illness mm -hmm. in the hospital. Right, and because child life specialists are very family-centered in our care, we also provide psychosocial support to not just the patient, but to the siblings and the parents as well. Because when a child is ill, it really does affect the whole family. 
things shift um, to a great degree depending on the type of illness, the length of the illness, and what the treatment will be will involve for the child. Um, often it takes a two-income family down to a one-income family, um, depending on the, the type of illness and the, the length of treatment, you know, what that will look like. Sometimes it's a life-altering injury that occurs, so it might be a more acute situation, but it can still cause um, really chronic changes that need to occur within the family. So I worked um, in a children's hospital for 22 years doing this work and just recently came outside of the hospital to provide this kind of support to children of adult patients. And there's a, there are a few child life specialists who are starting to do that work inside of adult hospitals, but large in part, Adult medicine really focuses on patient care, so they're very patient-centered, whereas in pediatrics, we're very family-centered. So it's a little bit of a shift in the adult medicine world to consider the needs of a child of a patient. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where Child Life is really trying to help kind of shore some of that up and to be able to provide support to children and teens of adult patients, which naturally should decrease the stress of the patient, which then, according to research, when we can decrease stress, we actually increase um, positive outcomes of treatment if we can lower the stress in the patient. So it kind of works hands in hand with that, but that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> and tell me more about that journey. So you did your work in the hospital, and then now you have your yeah. your company, your practice. Yeah, so we have a practice in Keller, as you mentioned. Um, it's called Lighthouse Council Center. And we work with kids four to 24 who have a parent with a serious illness. And we also have a real focus on anticipatory grief because sometimes treatment isn't successful. So how do we, parents might wonder, how do we prepare our children for the death of this parent? This is going to happen. Treatment isn't succeeding. Um, and we are now having to make those decisions. And how do we help a child um, kind of walk into that time? Um, so we have a real focus on anticipatory grief as well. And then grief support too. So um, on the other side of that, when a death has occurred, we provide grief support to um, children and teens of um, who have lost a parent or a sibling. Wow, Lindsay, I just, it's its a very heavy topic, but so needed, and you are such a gift to the community and what you're providing. What inspired you to start your practice? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I think that there were a lot of just different kinds of, com of events that sort of all came together at once. Um, nobody ever told me that I didn't have to stay in a job for my whole life. So when I started working in the hospital, I just kind of stayed. Um, and you know, I reached a point where I started to recognize that as what I'm doing really still what I want to be doing. Um, I'm at a different stage in my own life and as far as how old my own children were, the needs of my own parents are shifting. And I just thought, Let, what is this? what would this look like to take this outside of the hospital and can it be done? And and to note, there are child life specialists in other parts of the country who have had um, a private practice or a community practice for a number of years. Um, but there's maybe a dozen of them. There aren't very many of us. There's not very many child life specialists anyway, um, but there's there's not very many doing the work that we're doing. And um, I was aware of an organization called Wonders and Worries, which is in Austin. They also have offices in San Antonio and Houston, and they work exclusively with children of adult patients. And so I've known about them for a number of years, and that was something that was really interesting to me. And they have a training that you can go through that really prepares child life specialists for doing this work outside of the hospital, working with children um, and teens of adult patients. And so I did that three-day training and here and here we are. So our practice, we are the only Wonders and Worries registered providers I'm in North Texas um, doing this work. So that's amazing to hear and congratulations. I love that you're in Keller in my hometown. <laughs> Thanks. Share with me some stories. Share with me, you know, just kind of paint the picture how to reach out to you, when to reach out to you and some success stories that you've seen. How important is this to be proactive? Because there's such, when we're talking about even breaking down the anticipatory, you know, <clears throat> mom or dad has this illness, or even we have a passage that we'll share of a single parent. Mm -hmm. You want to read that? Yeah, I think that, I that would be that. Uh, just, I really like to paint this picture because I'm not personally um, a parent with a chronic illness, right? But I put myself in the 
mindset of what would my child feel? What would this be like? How could I get them some help? And so yeah. please go ahead and share uh, yeah. this passage as well. I think historically parents and professionals alike tend to rely on the resiliency of children. Well, children will just be fine. Right. We can. We should protect them. We should. We don't. We don't need to tell them everything. They're too young to really understand. And what happens accidentally? Because parents don't mean to do this. But what happens is you accidentally create a situation where the child is now experiencing the same thing, but they're experiencing it outside of the family on their own, which is a really insecure place for a kid to be. And I might say kids or children today, but I really mean from little kids all the way through young adults. Um, so when I say kids, just know that that's what I mean. But I, I think that what I like about these books, you know, reading from Anthony's point of view and and the um, it's an anonymous um, teen that wrote this next bit that we're going to read is it really helps us see what's happening inside their mind. And I think if more parents understood that, um, that they would be more interested in learning how to support their kids or reaching out for some support. Um, so unfortunately, we don't really know how old this little girl is, but she does at the end allude, allude to the next four years of high school, which leads me to think she's probably 12 or 13, um, somewhere in, in that area. Um, so she writes this to her mom. She says, Dear Mom, because of you, it only takes that one word to hit me hard, cancer. It stops the blood running through my veins. It stops the world that's going on around me. I stop to concentrate on what this word means to me, to you, and to others. Yet I do not have a definition of it in my head. Is it some kind of sickness that could ruin us? Or is it something that will be healed like my broken nose during soccer season? I Googled the word cancer for days. I checked it out on all the health sites, but I still don't have a clear understanding of what it is. The dictionary tells me a disease caused by an uncontrolled division of abnormal cells in a part of the body. But I think cancer has many more meanings than the counts of cells in your body. Cancer means the number of soccer games you'll actually be able to attend this year. How many nights you'll be up with me helping fix our printer for a school project due the next day. Or even how many more lectures I'll receive from you this year about what's right and wrong. It's been just near five months since you've been diagnosed with cancer, and not once have we talked about it. I push it aside like it's no big deal and you'll get through it, like you do with everything else. I'm in denial, to put it the simple way. Um, she goes on to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, just what this has been like, kind of her and, and the effects that it has. And she says, when you left your clumps of beautiful golden hair on the bathroom counter, I simply got a Kleenex tissue and covered them up and then went on doing my own business. When people would ask me where my mom was today, I put a smile on my face and told them the hospital with no further explanation, just like everything was peachy. Every night when reality hits, I cry for you. It's sometimes hard waking up to a puffy face and little tears in my own selfish matter. I think about myself sometimes. I ask myself the big question, what's going to happen to me if something bad happens to you? If we were your average family, we could tell everyone that I'll be just fine, living with my dad and siblings, continuing to live without you, but we're not. We're a family of two, just you and I. Although it still comes down to the question, what's going to happen to me? Am I gonna live with my grandma who's soon reaching 80? Am I being shipped off to my dad that I have no recollection of? Will I live with my aunt who loves her dogs more than anyone else? I hope this is a decision you'll never have to make. And I hope the answer will be that I'll always be with you. You're the one I will live with. You're the one that will get through this and live to tell the story. You'll be the one that will help me when my heart breaks, with my heart breaks soon to come. You'll teach me everything I need to know about what these next four years of high school will hold. Although no matter what happens, I know one place you'll always be in my heart. And these are the thoughts that our kids have. Whether we're asking them about the thoughts or not, the thoughts exist. What we do in our practice is create a space where kids can feel safe to ask the hard questions, where they can feel safe to ask the questions that don't always have answers to them. I think that's one of the things that parents really struggle with is parents naturally feel like they're supposed to help their children learn and prepare them for the world. And the, the parent is the expert, right? The authority, the one with all the information. And now a parent finds themselves in a situation where they really don't have the answers. Um, and it's hard to say to a kiddo, I don't know what's going to happen. So what we do in our practice is just kind of create a place for that. 
There's nothing normal about growing up in a home with a parent who has a serious illness. But what we do is we do help to normalize the feelings that those kids are experiencing because they're experiencing them whether we're creating a space for them to talk about it or not. How do you do that, Lindsay? Break that down for us because, and I love that you read this passage. I could barely make it through each sentence without tears streaming down my face. This is just another day at work for you. It is. Um, so we always start first just with building rapport and getting to know each of the kids. Um, none of the stuff that we do matters if they don't trust us. So gaining their trust, um, learning about them, um, learning about what this has been like from their perspective is is really critical. We, we've talked, of course, with the parent um, or parents, depending on what the situation looks like, um, heading into our first session with the kiddo. We've done that intake time, but the first session with the kids is just for them um, or a sibling group if there's more than one kiddo and it's appropriate to have them all together. Um, so we've got to get to know each other a little bit. Everything we do in our practice is very um, active, very hands-on. There's very little talky talk from just across, you know, you sitting on a couch and me sitting in a chair and us having a chit chat. I have a couch and a chair in our space, but I also have a table and art supplies and books and games and puppets and lots of ways for kids to express themselves and um, through their play and ways that they can't express it um, in their words. And so that first session is about getting to know each other. Then we'll do some illness education um, at our next session, really kind of understanding what's the child aware of so far. Um, I ask simple questions like, um, tell me about the day that you found out your mom was sick. Who told you? What do you remember? How did you feel about that? And it's not at all an interrogation. Um, it's just a conversation that we're having. But a lot of times those are questions that kids haven't been asked yet. And so giving them the opportunity to share their story, what was that like for you? How did you feel about that? What do you remember um, is critical. You know, kids are not we, we kind of tease that kids are just inherently selfish, and they're not. They're just in a very normal stage of development um, where things really are all about them. Um, and that's, that's an okay, healthy place for kids to be. We have to go through that stage to be prepared for the next one. Um, so talking a lot about what this experience is like for them is important. Um, we talk about feelings next. Um, what are you feeling? Where in your body do you feel that? What do you notice causes some of these feelings? Um, really creating a space for kids to start to have some awareness about what they're feeling. Sometimes they're just spinning, um, but they don't realize all these emotions that are taking place inside of them. Um, usually after kids get news that like this, um, they can hold it together pretty well on their own for about two and a half to three months. We could almost set a clock um, and know that from the time you tell them, two and a half months later, we're going to have a bit of a bump. That's usually when the schools say there's behavior challenges. That's interesting. Why is that, do you think? Um, that's a really great question. I think that they are able to just kind of maintain their own coping during that time. Um, it's it, just that shock. Mm -hmm. It's this, it is, maybe that is the resilience of kids, right? Yes. Because that number doesn't really waver um, across um, cultures or regions or diagnoses or even what kind of news it was. Um, it doesn't always have to just be news about an illness. It could be kind of hard news about anything. Um, and that's why parents think, oh, my kids are doing okay. My kids are fine. They're fine. And then they get two or and a half to three months later, and now the kids are not fine. And a lot of times parents go, I don't know what happened. Maybe there's something happening at school because I told them this hard thing and they've been okay for two months and now they're not okay. So maybe it's something else. Um, when really now the kids are having all of these questions and starting to really process and, and want to know um, things that maybe they didn't have the words to ask the questions for before. Um, so we create a space for that too. Um, one of my favorite activities to do um, when we start talking about, it, it's kind of all in that sort of education and feelings and sort of coping phase um, of the work that we do is um, I have an activity called a wonders, worries, and wishes jar that we do. And so we talk about what are things that you wonder about right now? So what are those questions that you have? Um, and sometimes the questions are, you know, what is cancer? Or how did my mom get this? You know, why did this happen to me? Sometimes they're questions like that. And um, 
it's always interesting to see the sorts of things that kids are still wondering about. Um, and then we talk about worries. What are some things that, that you're worried about that you um, kind of fill your mind at night? You know, nighttime is an interesting time for kids because everything slows down and gets quiet and their brain, just like adults, right, kind of starts to try to ruminate on the mm. things that they've sort of pushed aside during the day. So what are some of those things that you wonder about um, at, or worry about at night? You know, those those things that continue to um, maybe make your heart race, you know, or make you feel like you um, want to run away, you know, some of, some of those things. And then what are your wishes? What do you hope for what's coming? What do you, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it over this, what would you wish for? How would you make things look different? Um, and that's just sort of playing on the natural ability to say, I wish that I could make things different. Adults do this too, right? Um, what we do is just give kids permission to, um, to kind of wonder, we don't have the power to change the things. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't wish for it to still be different. That's so beautiful, Lindsay. Share with me some of those success stories because I know we shared a couple uh, children in the books. Well, keeping your families anonymous, just kind of painting the picture of, you know, family came in with X, Y, Z. You know, this wasn't a quick session. This is actually something that, you know, needed years to be able to help the family, you know, kind of get through this diagnosis and really equipping them for the future to be able to, no matter what life throws at them, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, whether that's an incredible amount of grief happening, you know, the family dynamics have changed. I'm just kind of throwing out some no, examples here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was a, a family, were, there were four children in the family. They were 10, 15, 18, and 22. Um, all of them needed support. Dad had been diagnosed, I want to say about a year earlier with um, a type of brain cancer um, called glioblastoma, which is very difficult to survive. Um, and so they were kind of a year into this and um, they'd already been, they'd had several surgeries and there had been treatment and there had been some things that had happened um, along the way. And, and mom finally realized that, um, that she needed some support beyond herself for her kids. And this sibling group was so beautiful. I did end up separating the 10-year-old and doing individual sessions with just her so that the 15, 18, and 22-year-old could process at a level that was more appropriate for them. I noticed that they wanted to kind of, they were sort of self-monitoring what they would say when their little sister was in the room, just again, doing what parents want to do. They wanted to protect their little sister. And That's so amazing they, that you picked up on that. Too. Oh, yes. Yes. That, I did my first session with them all together so we could all build rapport. And then... Um, and then we sort of split them out. Plus, she really liked the individual attention. Yes, yes. She, ten year olds want to kind of be center yes. stage anyway, so it was <laughs> it was a really good match for them all. Um, but they were a year into this, and there were still things that they didn't understand accurately about his diagnosis, um, what that even meant, what had happened, what um, they. I mean, the ten year old thought didn't even realize that that it was cancer that dad had and so that was just creating a space for them to like let's talk through it we have body books we have all kinds of books that talk about human anatomy and how our bodies work and um little manipulatives of body parts that kids can explore and investigate and kind of see up close which is not something that a lot of times they either want to do just spontaneously or get to do um so creating those opportunities too but i remember um the 18 year old was the he's the boy in the group so if you can win an 18 year old boy for the touchy feely let's talk about how things are going yes then you know that things are successful right and i remember after we did our um wonders worries and wishes session actually and um he we were finished and they were getting ready to go and and he said this was really great thanks for letting us come and talk about that and um, that family ultimately ended up doing a wonderful family project. So I'll do that a lot of times too when we're talking about anticipatory grief. We were now at a place where we were needing to prepare for dad's death. Um, so we do a family project. Um, what we what that means is it's, an, it's a way for, the, and the kids get to decide what the project will be. These kids decided they each wanted to do um, a scrapbook, um, but they wanted to do it with dad and talk about stories of what was happening in these pictures and what do you remember, dad? And um, 
Um, and dad had, by that point, had some mobility issues. Um, he was verbal still, but um, there were, you know, just some changes in, the, in his speech patterns by then. But the kids, you know, were on board with it. They didn't miss a beat with any of that. Um, and so that was a really beautiful time to get the chance to do that with that family and have them create something that, that now what we're doing is we're not just creating a legacy that they can look back at this um, scrapbook and have it's filled with memories of them with dad, but it was also something that they created with dad when he was sick and before he died. So just the process of going through it is now another memory that we're making. So it's another way for them to say down the road, do you remember that time right before dad died when we made these things together and all the things that we talked about and the things that we learned and um, their living room, or I'm sorry, their um, dining room table was just littered with scrapbook supplies and pictures. But it was a really beautiful time to see mom and dad and four kids all there, um, all there together, each working kind of individually, but also collaboratively and sharing ideas. Um, and then ultimately dad, um, dad did pass away. And, um, you know, one thing I remember about that family specifically is when we start to talk about grief, um, grieving happens before anybody ever dies. And that little girl said, when we were doing the wonders and worries and wishes part, she said, I wish that I could get just one more hug with both his arms. Because by then, um, he had a left-sided weakness, and so he couldn't get that arm up and around her to give her a hug. And she said, I didn't know that the last time I got a two-arm hug that that was going to be my last time. And so she was, here she was, 15 years old, really grieving this experience, and um, but didn't kind of going back and forth between, I didn't know that that was, that was it, and here's what I would do to just have one more of those. Um, so there's grief all along the way that we're helping that we're helping kids process, and that's really the point of the family project is to find a way that we can kind of what what would be one thing that you'd like to do. Some kids want to interview their parents, um, which I always think is really fun. Um, some kids want to create an art piece with their parent. Um, other kids like to do music. Um, some people want to do a trip, you know, just something to to make a memory that way. But that's so beautiful. I applaud you so much with how creative you get with families. Well, that is a natural um, quality of a child life specialist <laughs> because I just, we are so motivated to um, engage as many of the senses as possible when we're working with kids and families. And remember, coming out of the hospital setting, I'm already very accustomed to working with kids who maybe can't sit up in bed. Um, or can't move parts of their bodies, or can't lay in a certain position, or can't walk to a certain place, um, or can't speak at all. And so we always have to get very creative with how we can provide our interventions to be able to be successful to really help this child. And so it was very natural for me to bring all of that outside of the hospital as well. I love it. I love it. I love what you're doing. Let's share uh, the proactive approach. How does this help children into adulthood and process so and processing i guess yeah. and just if if they're not working with someone like you or understanding or kind of let's bury those feelings mm -hmm. um let's kind of share a little bit about what what could happen in, in adulthood and process yeah so child life specialists the work that we do is inherently preventative so we are often in the hospital, we're working with children at the time of diagnosis, um, treatment, procedure, injury, accident, trauma, whatever has happened. The goal being to mitigate the, the long-term chronic stress that could come from that sort of experience. So we're in the moment right there, teaching coping skills, helping to build resiliency, processing through what kids are experiencing. And what is a coping skill? Oh gosh, well, there's a whole there are, there are maladaptive coping skills. Those would be non-healthy coping skills, like um, a lot of those risk-taking behaviors, substance use, drinking, acting out. Um, violent aggression, running away, you know, those are all coping skills. Shutting down is also, withdrawing is also kind of a maladaptive coping skill. Um, so some positive healthy coping skills that we try to teach are ways to first recognize what's happening in your body. Can you name the feeling that's happening? And it's a physical feeling. A lot of times it is. Um, and adults kind of ignore that when we're, it's, but it happens to us too. Um, 
you know, we talk about fight or flight sometimes, and um, there's there's other aspects now. Fight or flight has grown beyond fight or flight. But if we just keep it at fight or flight for a second, um, you know, that was a that was a, a natural stress response that occurs in our body to keep us safe from harm. That's what that is. So I'm a hunter in a jungle, and a tiger is lashing out at me. Am I going to run? from the tiger, climb a tree from the tiger, or am I going to fight the tiger? And what your body naturally does is it sends, this is the way I describe it to kids, it sends all of this energy into your muscles so that your body is prepared to either run really fast or fight really hard. Mm. Um, That still happens today when we experience stress. It's just that it's not a tiger coming out of the jungle at you. It might be information that you were unprepared for or some experience that you were unaware of, or it might be a car crash, you know, that happens sort of suddenly and your body naturally sends all of this energy into your muscles because it's trying to prepare you for what you're going to do next. Well, what do we do with all that energy in our muscles now when it's a scary thing that's happening inside of our family? How do we adjust that? So sometimes the coping skill is recognizing I have all of this in my body. And teachers will see this a lot. They'll see kids bouncing in their seats, needing to get up and do a lot of things, moving around the room. Um, And I'm not confusing that at all with, you know, attention, you know, diagnoses. That's not to be confused in that. These are kids having an acute stress response. Um, but we have to teach them ways that we can naturally get rid of that, of that energy. So sometimes if we need to do some physical things, um, if we can get up and do 10 jumping jacks, then we should do that. If we need to punch something, then we should punch the thing safely. We do something in our practice. Um, I call it a different name. I feel every time I do it, I call it, I don't know, like a coping pillow or a feelings pillow. And, um, it's a very simple 20 by 20 throw pillow with a white pillowcase and um, the pillowcase before we put it on the pillow the kids right on one side anytime they want to punch at something or scream or hit or stomp or bite or yell into something whatever any of those sorts of big feelings they they draw one side or write words on one side when they just want to get a lot of that out of them and then the other side of the pillowcase might be more for comfort um when you need to calm down or when you need a cuddle or when you just want to cry softly into something or hold something close to you what are those things that bring you comfort and so they'll draw or write on that side of the pillowcase and then they take that with them so that's a tool that they now have at home that they can use anytime it travels well so if they are going to the hospital with to visit somebody or if they are going to be out of town or staying at grandma's house for something the pillow can go with them so um so coping skills are just ways that help us um sort of evaluate what's happening be in touch with our body kind of ground ourselves in the moment it might be noticing a few things in the room it might be taking some belly breaths there's all different kinds of breathing exercises that i teach to kids um, it might be getting some of that energy out of your muscles by doing a chair you know push up um, or jumping jacks you know 10 times or sometimes it's taking a big breath in and holding it for 10 seconds and then slowly breathing that out because what you're doing is you can't do any of those things without engaging your brain also And so when our brain is thinking, it kind of naturally calms those big raging feelings. Um, We can't think when we have big roaring feelings going on. And so if it's just a breath where you count to four, um, then that that often kind of helps to sort of balance things out a little bit. Lindsay, you're giving them the permission to have feelings and emotions. Completely. That's so important. And I think, you know, whether it's kids or adults, we live in a world where it's like, gotta be strong, gotta be strong, gotta put a good face on, or we'll talk about that later. Yes. And you're get, creating that environment. It's okay. It's okay to have feelings mm-hmm. and to punch the pillow. And here's the words and some tangible coping skills, mm-hmm. real coping, life-changing skills. And that's right. just so incredible that that you teach that. And then that, those are lifelong skills that can carry through adulthood versus the acting out in substance abuse. Absolutely. And, you know, these are very... Uh, people that are grieving, grieving well, from childhood possibly. And very much. And I really think you're you're saving lives. You truly are because there can be so many acts of violence and other ways that some of this can manifest that, that we do see on the news, unfortunately, that you just have no mm-hmm. idea, you know, what somebody's going through in the car next to you, right? right. Uh, and so I, I just celebrate you for that. Thank you. And thank you so much. In closing here, if you're comfortable sharing Why do you do what you do? And is this healing for you? Um, very much. So, you know, I, when, when people knew I worked in the hospital, I would often hear, oh my gosh, 
I could never do that. That must be so hard. Um, I, I get think this... a lot of our <laughs> viewers and listeners are wondering that myself. Right. Like, I get the I'm same like... kind of comments today. Like, oh my gosh, I could not do that. How like, do you Where do does that? she come from? She's just so strong and so beautiful and so amazing. And your energy is, you know, you, you deal with tragedies. Uh, you deal with so much. And, and I wouldn't say deal with, maybe I, I could censor the word a little bit more. You're working through. Well, and we're teaching kids how, like, listen, hard things are going to happen in your life. This is one hard thing. It's a massive hard thing. Um, and yet you're doing it and you're going through it. And hey, moms and dads, coming back to the feelings for just a second, you have a tremendous opportunity right now to model for your kids how to feel something hard. Um, it's okay for your kids to see you cry. Um, that gives them permission to also feel sad at home. I hear kids say a lot, I don't want to talk to mom about that because it will make her sad. Well, listen, your mom's already sad. And what she would like to be is with you in that. You know, neither of you are going to make the other one sad. You're already feeling that. And so when parents can feel their feelings and it's okay to cry in front of your kids, it's okay for them to see you be angry about what you're facing. You know, that that those are normal feelings. So let's not try to pretend like parents are superheroes that just don't feel normal human feelings when, or robots, that might be a better word. Parents are not robots, you know, who don't feel very natural human feelings when something tragic is happening. It's normal to feel those things. And so parents have an opportunity to model for their kids, you know, I feel sad. Here's what I do when I feel sad. And then we continue, we continue to move forward. Um, a little bit, a little bit about why I do what I do. Um, and there is this interesting sort of upside down kind of parent-child dynamic to it. Um, my mom's dad, so my grandfather died when my mom was six. He died very suddenly in a car crash, um, which a lot of the grief work that we do in our practice is actually sudden, like very unexpected death. Um, he died very suddenly in a car crash when my mom was six. And this was 1950. Seven, early 57 that he died. And so we didn't have, we didn't know about child development. I mean, the theories that everything that we're doing today with kids, that those theories didn't even get published until the 60s. So it's, I'm not at all saying that my grandmother should have known better. She knew exactly what she knew at the time. There wasn't information available. And I don't know what her very well-meaning friends or family might have told her, but here she was widowed. I think she was 29 when she was widowed. She had four children. They were nine, six, four, and 18 months old. My mom was the six-year-old. Um, they never spoke about their dad. My mom never saw a picture of him until she was in college. Wow. She didn't know that he had blue eyes until I was born. Um, they, my grandmother got remarried at some point and they now were no longer allowed to refer to their dad as daddy. He was now called daddy George. Um, so their stepfather was now, was now dad. And, um, she never knew about her dad. She was never allowed to talk about him, never granted permission to ask questions or be curious. Um, and nobody ever shared about him. And then she grew up and she became an adult who had all of these wonders and worries and wishes kind of in her own self. And um, she became very performance driven kind of person. Um, it was all about how she could just make things look okay on the outside, which is definitely what was modeled for her when she was young. And I grew up in that home with her. My sister and I have talked about this often. I've talked about it with my mom and, and I don't, I wouldn't say that that's what well, I don't know if that's what drove me to do this work. Um, it wasn't a conscience, conscientious decision that I made. Um, but as I started learning about the way that um, trauma and grief affect children in their little developing mind, I could certainly then look at my mom, the adult, and see these patterns in her now that because they were not addressed when she was young. And she was now, her coping skills were just suck it up and hold it together and make it look like everything is fine and occasionally lose my mind and go berserk and then just pretend like everything is fine again. Um, and it was a really difficult home at times to, to grow up in. Um, she's in a really healthy place now. Um, we've talked a lot about things and she and I have processed a lot about what happened um, when she was young. But um, 
I think my my goal right now for kids is um, I want to strengthen the parent-child relationship while they're going through what they're going through. And I want to help as many kids as possible not end up 20 years down the road wondering why they don't trust people or why they can't feel love or why they have a hard time um, kind of going through their own sort of stressful experiences. If we can mitigate as much of that as possible when they're young by giving them tools and resources and helping create a space where they can safely talk about the things that are happening inside their homes, specifically for us related to illness or injury or grief, um, then I think we're doing a good thing for them um, and for their families going forward for sure. Lindsay, so, thank you so much for sharing, and I want to give your mom a big hug. You both She's have done touched, really good you work. You have touched so many people just sharing that story, thank and you. it it makes you even more human and relatable because you and your mom have been there in a grieving sense where you can't even put into words, you know, yeah. what what that could feel like growing up in in a home of grief and not being able to talk about yeah. it. And the important piece too that I I think it would be unfair for me to finish today without sharing it, is kids are still in very rapid development. Yes. We can certainly look at an infant and we can see massive development that happens in the first year, right? But um, but kids remain in, in rapid development, I'm really into um, young adulthood. And we might give a child information that's important. Let's just say like little Anthony, who I read about in that first section, he's eight years old when his mom is diagnosed, right? Um, he will have new questions about her diagnosis when he's 10 and when he's 12 and when he's 16, because cognitively he will continue to develop. So he will wonder things down the road that he didn't know to wonder when he was eight wow, because they so weren't important to him. That. Right. So it's normal for us to see kids revisit this and need to talk through things again because they're processing and understanding things in a, in a really new way as their brain continues to develop. And you're able to articulate that back to the parents on here's mm -hmm. what they can handle now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncommon either for me to finish um, our work. So like our illness education curriculum is really, it's only about six sessions and um our grief curriculum is about eight to 12 sessions. And then really we're transitioning the kids back. They don't need to come here all the time, um, but it's not uncommon for parents to swing them back for two or three sessions as we approach um, an important holiday or dad's birthday, or they now have questions that they weren't asking you know, a year ago and, and mom or dad wanna kind of bring them back for some check-ins. That's not uncommon either. So um, just because we transition them out doesn't mean that that relationship is closed completely and they can never return for just one or two check-ins. They always can. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you. I highly encourage everybody to go check out the website, Lighthouse Council Center. Lindsay, how do we get a hold of you? Um, the website's a great place to do that. Um, there's a form on there that you can easily fill out for a free consultation that we have. The email is there. You can send an email to hello at lighthousecouncilcenter.com. Um, phone number is also on the website. We have social media as well. We're on Instagram and Facebook. And every Friday, I do something called um, Book Love Friday, where I share some of the books that I really like to use in my own practice, um, working with kids, and um, help kind of let parent, introduce them to parents a little bit so maybe parents can add some of these books to um, kind of their bookshelf at home. I love that. What is it about the books that's so healing and helpful? Well, the thing about the books is that um, it it doesn't force the child to come up with it on their own. It helps the child go, oh, other people feel that too, or um, it simplifies concepts. I like to use children's books even with teenagers because Children's books are, are meant to be simple. So they take really hard concepts and they simplify it down in a way that helps teens and adults too, um, which is why I think children's books are so crucial um, and we should always just have, have the books. Um, so I use a lot of them for that regard. I have books about illness, anticipatory grief, grief, sometimes just to start big feelings that we need to be able to go, let's see what this book says about that. It's normal to have a lot of different feelings at the same time. Kids don't sometimes know that, so. We cannot wait to check out your social media. Thanks. I know I've seen it and you're just so amazing. And thank you so much. I can't wait to have you back. Thanks for having me, Sarah. It was really fun. Yes, absolutely. All right, guys, that's been this edition of Talk of the Town. Go ahead and check out Lindsay Hammond. She has so many resources available and a big hug ready for you. See you guys next time.
This show is brought to you by Real News Communications Network, your digital destination for video podcasts, produced by media and podcast experts. Podcasting at the speed of news, powered by Real News PR. Visit realnewscn.com for our podcast show library and launchashow.com to do just that. Launch a show. Thank you.